I'm going to start a message series today that I'm simply going to call that this is a journey to hope. And I believe that we are desperately in need of hope. I noticed on my Facebook account yesterday, I had in one of those memories that pop up on your screen when you sign, sign in, um, it showed a letter I wrote to the church one year ago. And it was all about us shutting down. You remember that? It was about the shutdown. A year ago, uh, exactly yesterday, we started sharing with the church that it looks like we're going to only have 10 people that can be in a worship service. And we did that for weeks. As you may remember, six or seven weeks before we started having services back, we had a couple of practice weeks in May. So it's just amazing that a year has passed with us being under the oppression of this pandemic. And praise God for those, uh, every day I hear of more in our church and more neighbors and friends that are getting the vaccine. And so praise the Lord for that. I want you to join me today in this message series. What we're basically going to do is look at the last 75 to 78 hours of the life of Jesus and even the crucifixion and up till the, the period where he is resurrected. In this series, I'm going to go beyond that because I think it's real important that you see the effect, the impact, the power of the resurrection. So I want to show you how that uh, ministered to two individual disciples after, the, after Easter Sunday, and then I want to take you to one more and how uh, the disciples ended up being commissioned and had their life mission given to, to them by Jesus after the resurrection. So we're going to spend about the next seven, eight weeks on the topic. And today I want to take you to Gethsemane. The disciples have just had this intimate time where they observed the Lord's Supper. And the Lord told them what would happen, that they would be persecuted and they would scatter. And he tells them about Judas and how Judas is the betrayer. He tells them about Peter and how Peter will deny him three times. And right after this eye-opening Lord's Supper event, they leave that upper room and start to go across the valley. He has his inner circle with him, that being James and uh, and and uh, his his uh, James John and uh, <laughs> and I've got I've got one of those moments right. It might be uh, and uh, anyway they this inner circle and and he takes them with him to Gethsemane. It's across the Kidron Valley and here's what's so amazing. If you go today, all these things you can still see. This is all still in play. And so I want to take you there today as we look at these last 78 hours of our Lord's life and ministry that was here upon the earth. And some of it will be the time that he is in the tomb. And we'll look at that as a build up to Easter and then the effect and impact thereafter. But I noticed this statement. Chuck Schley said this. He said, there will never, we will never be able to comprehend the cosmic struggle that Jesus experienced in the Garden of Gethsemane that night before his crucifixion. We'll never understand that. We'll never get the emotional struggle between Jesus' hu human and divine side. We just won't, we won't get that. We, I don't know that we ever can understand that fully, the struggle that was there. Because Jesus was very aware of what was coming his way. And I want you to go there with me today because we'll look at these last hours of his life. This event, the garden, it uh, has reverberated right down through the centuries, the agony that Jesus obviously was under in this setting. And Chuck Swindoll points out in one of his recent books about the struggles and all the things that came out of this period of Jesus' life, the things such as but uh, the spirit's willing but the flesh is weak, sweating drops of blood, and even the statement, uh, he who lives by the sword will die by the sword. All those statements that are still very much a part of our culture 
And very much sayings in our culture came from Matthew 26, 52, Mark 14, 38, Luke chapter 22, verse 44. Of course, the impact of Gethsemane is that it changed everything for us, didn't it? So here, join me in this journey as we walk across the Kidron Valley into the valley or into the Garden of Gethsemane and watch what happens with Jesus in this setting. So here's what's said in verse 32. It says, and it's a special prayer place that's really called Gethsemane. They went to a place called Gethsemane and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I shall pray. So at this point, he doesn't ask them to pray. He just tells them to sit there and then he will do, uh, he will come back to them as you will see on a couple of occasions. Let's pray together. Father, teach us by the power of your spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name, Lord, that we would just see uh, this setting of how Jesus struggled, but yet, Father, his, his will, even knowing what was coming his way, he still endured the shame, endure, endured this uh, mockery of a court setting. Father, he was tortured, and then he died, having the sin of all people of all time placed upon his very being, knowing separation from you for the first time in eternity past. Father, I pray that some of the magnitude of this would come home to us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the historian Josephus tells us that this is all still very visible, but it tells us about this Kidron uh, brook that ran down through uh, Gethsemane. And that during the time of sacrifice in Jerusalem uh, near Passover, that this water, this spring, would, would be so full of the blood sacrifices that it would run red. And how appropriate that 12 hours after this time in Jesus' life, He's going to suffer and bleed and then eventually die for us. The Gethsemane term comes from two Hebrew words, gat and shaman. And it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit distorted in our English language. There wasn't a good way to translate it. I always wondered when I was growing up and then especially as I became a young pastor, I, I preached several times at a church called Gethsemane. And I'm like, wow, is, I wonder if it's a church that struggles a lot. You know, with all the, the, the meaning of Gethsemane. But uh, it means olive press. And you got a wonderful picture today of exactly what they're talking about. That they're showing you this active olive press that's right there in, uh, in Gethsemane to this day. And you are literally getting to see that today in some of the, the olive trees that are still there. But think about it as a place that was much like a place that um, you and I might as a young couple or maybe as a person that was trying to, to go have some time alone with your family, much like we do when we go to the park and have some interaction and, and play. Uh, well, the, you know, the kids don't, wouldn't go swing on these trees, but the disciples repeatedly went there. This was a place that they repeatedly went to go talk. It was a place that Jesus took them for instruction. It was a place that we learn from reading in other places in Scripture that it was a place that they uh, often would, would go to. And the book of Luke points that out, that they often went to Gethsemane to pray. So it's interesting that in this particular case, that's exactly what happened. It's also interesting to think about that Gethsemane being this place that is... Uh, where the olives were pressed, that Jesus himself would be pressed, wouldn't he? That he would be under such stress and pressures in this. And I want you to notice that it may very well be that the Garden of Gethsemane was one of the most stress-filled moments in the earthly life of Jesus. I don't say the most because it may be that the cross and what happened on the cross may have been even the most stressful. But it is common that they went there. In the book of Luke, it tells us these words, Luke chapter 22, verse 39, Jesus went out as usual, notice the term as usual, to the Mount of Olives. 
and his disciples followed him there. So he was right there in this vicinity in the Garden of Gethsemane. Second of all, I want you to see and us just to enter into today how we have such hope because of what Jesus went through. And I want us to look in on Jesus on his most emotionally and painful struggle that he had perhaps up to this point in his life. So go with me to verse 33 and 34 now, and I wanted to set up some stuff before we go to his prayer. And watch this. Here's what's said. So the, the fill in there on number two is the word struggle. He took Peter, James, and John. That was the one I was missing a moment ago. Peter, James, and John, his inner circle, and it's I don't know about you, but almost all of us have inner circles, and there's nothing wrong with that. In the disciples, he had an inner circle of core people that were in there a little deeper and just a little tighter to him than all the rest. He loved them all. He used them all. They had a wonderful relationship. They all traveled with him. But we know that Peter, James, and John, had a, they were part of this inner circle that Jesus had, kind of a, a core group of leaders inside that group. One of the best studies I ever did is I, I took several men through a study. In fact, there were so many guys that wanted to do it. We had to do a class and then we had to do another class right after that uh, where we did a study on the disciples and how God chose them, why he chose them, how God used them. And it's a fascinating time. Spend some time doing that sometime. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply, listen to this, deeply distressed and troubled. Then he says to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. You haven't heard Jesus talk like this at any point in his ministry until now. But as we are in the Garden of Gethsemane and he is praying through this very difficult night before he goes to be, I mean, it's a mockery of a court setting. Before he's tortured and before he's hung on a cross and he bleeds and he dies for us. And I just don't know that we can enter into this in any full way. But notice the language. It says that he was distressed and what? He was distressed and troubled. When did you hear Jesus talk like that in his entire earthly ministry? We've seen him get upset. We've seen him run money changers out of the temple court. We've seen him do other things where we saw a lot of emotion. We've seen him cry at the grave of his friend Lazarus. Even knowing that he's getting ready to call him forth out of the grave. He loved him and he cries. We see him at other times where he... he uh, is very emotional but when did you ever see him distressed and troubled and then to go even further in verse 34 my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow Jesus is trying to communicate with his inner circle that he is he is about to undergo the most pressure-packed moment of his life in the garden he's praying as he always did. Isn't prayer such a gift from Almighty God? Prayer is such a gift to us, isn't it? That in your most stressed, filled moments, you can go to God and know that he hears you and responds. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Matthew's version of these events say something a little different. In, in, in the Greek text, it has this language where it says, Jesus fell on his face. It, it may very well be that he was, he was so overwhelmed that he physically, you've seen people get to this place. I have seen people in, in my life where they were so overwhelmed by news, horrible news that they got that they just fell to the ground. They fell out. They passed out. Jesus fell on his face. The Gospel of Matthew tells us he literally just fell out on his face. I want you to think about that. When did Jesus, think about all the things that he went through. And we look at all kinds of places in scripture, in other places in the gospels, and we don't see, we don't see this playing out like this, do we? Jesus, whether he's facing a storm or whether he's debating with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the people that were religious leaders in the day, you don't see him, you don't see him 
being under this great pressure, he's cool, calm, and collective. One of the things I love about Jesus all through the Gospels is that he's cool. Amen? I mean, you know, if you wrote it and you know what's going on, you know, you can do that a little, a little easier than perhaps we can. But it, it was amazing to me. That's one of the things that are, it's so godlike about Jesus that he stays under control. And he stays so cool, calm, and collective. Do you have that experience when you have great pressure moments in your life? Well, he did. But in this story, it's not that way. In fact, we don't read it in this gospel uh, account in the book of Mark. I'm in Mark chapter 14, by the way. But we read in other gospels, in all the other gospels, Matthew and Luke, this rendering where we hear these words. His sweat was as... It were great drops of blood falling down from the ground. And it's so interesting to look at that because uh, hemotidrius, dr dros drosis. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not a medical doctor and I just proved that with my pronunciation there. But it, it's literally the, the condition where there is such a stress on the body that that people sweat blood and it's not something that just happened in the life of Jesus it's been documented where people are are such under such stressful environments that these capillaries will burst in those sweat glands and blood will join their sweat as it comes out and in that passage notice that it describes how stressful this was to Jesus that he was he was, as it says in, in the Gospel of Matthew, his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling where? Now, I can tell you, we can go through a summertime here and get out, outside and do some work in your yard, or you can get up in your attic uh, when, it's, when it's really hot. Uh, you can sweat and sweat and sweat. Now, I know you ladies, you just glow, right? But we fellas, we sweat. And some of you ladies are going, no, I sweat too. Uh, listen, I, uh, I'm a sweater, man. I, I remember the days of uh, just being in different settings, and I mean, sweat just rolls off of me. In fact, uh, this morning I've been a little hot in here and uh, just, just had to kind of uh, button, loosen up the buttons just to, just to cool off a little bit from first service. But these tiny capillaries in the sweat glands can rupture, mixing blood with the, with the perspiration. This has been documented not just in the case of Jesus, but it's happened with different people throughout history. It's real. He really did sweat. I want you to think about the stress that would be on someone that they would sweat drops of blood. And notice the language in Matthew, literally in the Greek text, it's running off of his being. It's dropping block, drops of blood on the ground. I mean, this is before there's any torture. It's the mental anguish of knowing what he was about to face. And what's the reason he's doing this? Because he loves you. Because he wants to be an obedient son to his heavenly father. Because whatever the price, he's willing to pay it so that you can have a pathway to heaven. That's what's going on here. So you read this and you realize, and I don't think we uh, really realize. I want you to really think about this. Have you really ever thought about what Jesus went through? Bob Deffenberg wrote a gospel on the book of Luke. He writes these words. Never before have we seen Jesus as emotionally distraught. He has faced a raging storm in the Sea of Galilee, totally composed, unruffled. He's faced demonic opposition, satanic temptation, and the grilling of, of Jerusalem's religious leaders with total composure. But here in the garden, the disciples must have been greatly distressed by what little they saw. Here, Jesus cast himself to the ground. He's agonizing in prayer. Something terrible is getting ready to happen. Jesus knew it, and the disciples were starting to comprehend it as well. The men were praying, right? His inner circle. He took them with him. 
What role do you think they were supposed to have? What role do you think they were supposed to have? Because I think the church is in the same boat often, and we need to think through this, and we as the body of Christ need to look at this. So I want to take you to two different things, and that is this. I want to take you to looking in on two very different prayers. We're going to talk about the prayers that Jesus requested that his inner circle, Peter, James, and John, would, would be a part of praying with him and through him and for him. And I want to take you to Jesus' prayer in some detail here. Go with me to verse 35, down to verse 40. And we're looking into two very different prayer meetings. One has already started. The other, that's nah, pretty half-baked. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed. As we said from the Ma Gospel of Matthew, he may have just fell out on his face. But he's praying. And he cries out in that prayer that if it's possible that this hour pass from him. You're looking at perhaps one of the most human moments of Jesus. I tend to look at the divine side of Jesus because he's my Lord and Savior. I think most people look at the divine side. But you're looking at the very human side of Jesus. Lord, is there another way we could do this? Is there a way that this cup passes from me? Watch this. He says, Abba, Father, da-da. Just like we hear, you know, this week we had our grandchildren around and hearing the little ones, he's starting to talk and they were, we were uh, just hearing Mama and Dada and all, you know, he's just, he's just uh, uh, a little guy, but we were so enjoying them this week and uh, sad to see him go. Uh, but he says in his prayer, Abba, Dada, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. We watch Jesus in this moment be willing to be as a human, totally, completely conforming to what God had for his life, no matter what. What an appropriate song they were leading us in a little bit ago about here am I. I'll go. You can send me. Do you notice those words today? How appropriate for this message. Listen. Verse 37 says, Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. That's a prayer meeting. That's a prayer meeting. He returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. He said, Simon, he said to Peter, Are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Here's that phrase. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more, he went away and prayed the same. When he came back, he again found them doing what? Sleeping. Think about the agony Jesus is in. He takes his inner core of leaders from his 12 down to his three of this inner core of James and John and Peter. And look at this. Of course, he speaks to Peter. Obviously, Peter already the, the clear leader, even though Paul comes along later. Jesus had disciple, he had told the disciples, he had instructed them, and they failed to pray. I want to tell you something. I think the church of Jesus Christ is like this. We as Christians are like this, where there's just things that come up in our culture, in our world, and in the ministry, and in the church, and we're asleep to it. I want to tell you something. There's something going on right now that you need to be fully engaged and awake. And I want to tell you something, our house, I mean, what's going on in Washington, D.C. is deeply troubling. I mean, I am deeply troubled, deeply troubled. If you read the article I put out in the newsletter, I also did a very similar article in my blog. Yesterday, there was over 100 people that read it, and they started contacting their senators in the other states that they live in. That's exactly what I was trying to accomplish. 
And you say, well, hey, Ted and John, our senators, they're not going to vote for that nonsense. No, they won't, but they still need to hear from you. We need to be a mass voice of Christ. Listen, it's a game changer. I mean, we're talking about literally being legally hamstrung of what language you can speak legally. I mean, we're talking about not just, I mean, listen, we, biblically speaking, let's go there, okay? Let's talk about real theology here. There is but one human race, one. Anytime you spend all your time focusing on race, you know what it does? You might make some headway on making some ground on some things, but it divides us. Listen, there is something bigger to me that has united me with other humans, and it's the gospel of Jesus Christ, where I'm now a citizen of the kingdom of God, not just a citizen of these United States. And I tell you this with all that's in me, I am a citizen of the kingdom of God first. And my citizenship here in the, I have dual citizenship, by the way. You know, that's going on all over the globe now. But I, I, I know that when we talk about ethnicity and we constantly talk about race, it tends to divide us and you're labeled by what skin color you're wearing and what language you speak. And God's above all that. He really is. God brings us together in the body of Christ and he unites us. And we need to see that that's the commonality we all share. And listen, it makes you treat each other different, right? The prejudices that I may have had prior to coming to Christ dissolved in front of the majesty of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that said, don't ever think about somebody like that again. Now they're my precious child. You see that, don't you? Now you see that this is the great uniter. And I believe, I literally believe we're barking up the wrong tree. I really do. There could all be all kinds of devastation I'm not kidding you. You need to be alert to this. It very quietly passed the House, basically by a very divided vote. And it's going to be in the Senate, and the Senate is just neck and neck. I mean, it's a 50-50 thing now. And I'm telling you, if this passes, you're talking about hardship for Christianity? I can remember being in, in Canada a few years ago, and they told me there were things that I could not say. If I did, it may shut down what we were doing. It may shut down even the church for hate speech. Because see, once it's legally established that that's what that is, if you say something to the contrary, listen, there is two genders and there is one human race. I'm not gonna shut up about that because I believe those are uniters. There are, there's two genders. There's a male and there's female. Read the blog, respond. Don't be the Christian like these. This is Jesus' inner circle, and what are they doing? They're sleeping. They're unaware of the magnitude of what Jesus is facing, and when it counted most, they were not there for him. Don't let it be said of you, and don't let it be said of the church. I mean, we're, we're in some, I mean, this, this is some, this is not political speech, guys. I'm talking biblical theology. I'm talking about things that don't change for the church. They don't change for us as Christians. We can't have because it's, the culture's going this way. We can't, we can't go there. We're called by Almighty God to stand on what is true. And I am very concerned of what results may come if this becomes law. Now, you respond. And if you didn't know about it, I had, I had several people in first service say, until I read your article, I didn't even know this was going on. I didn't know. We've got to respond. We've got to. While we can speak about it. Listen to this. His disciples just failed him in this moment, didn't they? Jesus, in his prayer, it's extremely agonizing, isn't it? He goes through this agony. Think about he knows there's this battle going on. I don't believe that he was in one moment at a place of compromise. He just shows us how human his side, this side was about knowing what was yet to come. And when it all came down, what did he say? He said, God, I'll do what you say. 
I'll do what you say. Listen to this. His disciples know that he's disappointed with where they are. And he tells them in verse 36, he's, you know, when he prays that prayer, Lord, if it's possible for this to pass, take this cup from me. That cup, the cup word is used, um, it's, it's used for the wrath of God. You'll see it in Psalm 75, Isaiah 51. You'll see it in Jeremiah 25. Uh, you'll see it in Revelation chapter 14 where it talks about this cup of wrath, the wrath of God being poured out. So when Jesus uses that terminology, he's talking about can this cup, all this suffering, is there, a, is there some other way in that human moment? But what does he say? God, not my will but yours, totally compliant to the will of God. You know, you may be in a Gethsemane period in your life. We've had a tough year, haven't we? It's been very tough. A lot of people going through a lot of difficult things. Perhaps this is the most tough moment in Jesus' life until he's actually hanging on the cross and we hear those incredible words because of his suffering, my God, my God, quoted from Psalm 20. 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, so that he can bring us to God. Think about this passage, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, says, for he made, for he made himself to be sin for us, who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God. See, Jesus did all that for us. Last of all, Jesus suffered and died to give us life. Look at verse 41. He says these words, returning a third time, he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is being delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Gethsemane is this cosmic, spiritual, physical battle in the mind of Jesus. He was emotionally tortured in this moment, knowing what was coming, knowing what he would have to endure, the mockery at the court setting, the, the torture that would take place, and then to have all sin of all time placed on a, on a human being that for eternity past as the Christ had never experienced sin. Think how bad you feel when you've been convicted of just a sin in your life. Imagine all sin of all time being placed on a human being. We just can't relate to that. Psalm 22 says that his heart burst, and it may very well have. We know that blood and water flowed when the spear was put in his side, showing that he was indeed dead. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says something amazing. Listen to this. Looking to Jesus, what we should all do is look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for the joy, notice that he doesn't say the joy in his suffering, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, obedience, getting past all the suffering, he didn't glorify in the suffering, he looked beyond that to the victory that would be for all people and that he would be back in his rightful place at the right hand of God. I want you to think about that because, see, he didn't focus on, you know, he, he wasn't sadistic in some way that he's going to enjoy this torture and suffering like this. What he says to us is that he looked beyond that, and that's the message for all of us in our sufferings, that you look beyond that to where, to the victory and when the suffering may cease. And that's exactly what Jesus did. I want you to see something in wrapping up. Let me give you three things that I think are takeaways for us today. Here they are. Number one, Gethsemane teaches us the extreme cost of our sinfulness. Man, Jesus was battling with this, wasn't he? He was battling. But he says, not my will, but yours. I am both divine and I'm human. I'm the God man, I'm fully God and I'm fully man. But in this moment, he knows what's coming. In his divine knowledge, he knows what's coming his way. He knows how he's going to suffer. And like I said, we can't, 
We cannot grasp how innocence has all sin of all time placed upon it and how that, what that did to him. That's why he cried out, my God, my God on the cross, why have you forsaken me? In the first time in eternity past, he never knew separation from God the Father. But he did then. God will not dwell where there's sin. And in that moment, he couldn't even be with his son. That all happened for his love. For us, I mean, it's, it's overwhelming. Our suffering, no matter how bad, in this lifetime, and some of you are suffering right now with different things, our suffering cannot ever come close to the suffering of our Lord. One of the things that I've used with people a lot that have lost loved ones and different things that happen. They've had job loss and man, all the, all the poverty and financial issues that come with that and health issues and things, you know, even losing a child. I want you to hear something. In Philippians chapter three, Jesus said this, or, or Paul wrote it, but he says that I may know him. This was Paul's testimony and the, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. How about that? You see, when we suffer, we might be able to relate a little more to what suffering Jesus did. And nobody ever suffered like Jesus. It's really important you get that because when we have our suffering, what happens? We have pity parties, don't we? And in our pity parties, we suffer and we're like, man, nobody's had, had it as bad as I have. Oh yeah, they have. In fact, Jesus had it worse. He really did. We cannot even enter into how bad this suffering was at this time for Jesus. And he says, and being made conformable, conformable unto his death. Last of all, remember this. We have this as a takeaway as well. We are, we are reminded of the tremendous power of prayer. What helped Jesus as a man get through the last night of his earthly life before he went to the cross. What helped him? Same thing that will help you. And don't ever forget this. God has given you a gift in prayer. Whether it's prayer at the altar in a service and you come and pray and say, God, I'm struggling. Help me. But you will have Gethsemane moments in your life just like Jesus. And the answer that Jesus points you to is the same answer you have to come to. And what is that? You get on your face before God. And you cry out to the living God. And he hears you. And he meets you there. And he gets you through. Doesn't he? Gethsemane is a reminder that prayer is this powerful gift tremendous power of prayer and Jesus reminded the disciples pray that you will not fall into temptation just like in this passage what's your takeaway today anybody suffering in here I guarantee you none of us has suffered like Jesus did we cannot even enter into I, I, I can paint a picture but words fail I, I can describe, but my words are so inadequate. Jesus suffered for us in ways we cannot fathom. Father, in this place, someone might need to crown Jesus as Lord and repent of their sin and make him their Lord and Savior, the leader of their life. Others need to pray, and Father, they need to have an attitude adjustment where you grab a hold of their heart and help them through their Gethsemane moments that they find themselves in, where they're in such an emotional turmoil and such a period of, of suffering and struggle in their life. Help them, Lord. And Lord, I pray that some may even come to the altar today, and Lord, just thank you for what happened at Gethsemane for all of us, that they may respond in prayer. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to all stand together. If you need to respond to the Lord, you come. Hey, thanks for being with us online. We're going to just have a little private time of just some decision response time that we have that we call our invitation. But uh, thanks for joining us, and you can join us again on Sunday. For those of you in house.